Conway's Game of Life is an interesting project that can either be relatively easy peasy lemon squeezy or difficult difficult lemon difficult if you follow its ideas to a T. I'll let you in on a hint, most people don't. Hi, hello, I'm Bear the Coder and welcome to Coding from the Car and today it's raining. Uh, today we're going to talk about John Conway's Game of Life. Firstly, let me preface this by saying I will not be walking you through the code step by step because good god coding videos are boring to watch and boring to make. Instead, in the description you will see a link to my repository where I already did all the work for you, and inside this repository will be three scripts and instructions to get everything working. The rest of the video will be a retrospective because journaling my experiences is far more fun. Firstly, the TLDR. The Game of Life is cells and stuff. Or, as a long answer, the Game of Life is an example of a cellular automaton, aka cells on a grid that evolve based on the prior generation and its predefined rules. The quote, game, was created by mathematician John Conway as a response to a theoretical idea mathematician John von Neumann had about colonizing or mining the universe. This theory was called the theory of self-reproducing automata. In essence, if you wanted to colonize Mars, you could send over tons of supplies, spaceship after spaceship, and eventually send a team of people to make Mars a livable planet. But this is difficult, expensive, and dangerous for the crew. Or imagine you could send nanobots. These nanobots could, like a virus, replicate exponentially using the resources the planet provides until there are millions of nanobots at your disposal. You could then use this army of nanobots to create and provide the resources your team would need to colonize the planet. Well, turns out, creating self-reproducing machines is a bit harder than originally thought. Not to be dissuaded, John von Neumann created the Universal Constructor, which was a 29-state automaton which paved the way for cellular automata as we know it today. Conway, motivated by von Neumann's work, decided to start experimenting with cellular automata in the late 60s, and the game of life is a result. The rest is history. Now that we've gotten to this point, how do you play the game of life? Well, it's not exactly a game, per se. It's more like a simulation, maybe? Also, Conway called this a zero-player game, so I can't imagine we'll be doing much playing, either. So, imagine you have a grid. An infinite grid that goes on forever and always. This grid is made of cells. These cells can be one of two states, either dead or alive. This state is determined by the cell's eight neighbors, which are located in each cardinal direction around the cell and at each diagonal. Each cell follows three rules depending on the state of its neighbors. Rule 1, if the cell is alive and has either less than two or more than three alive neighbors, the cell dies. Rule 2, if the cell is dead and has exactly three alive neighbors, the cell becomes alive. And rule 3, if an alive cell has two or three alive neighbors, they get to live on to the next generation. And that's it. That's how you play. And honestly, as programmers, we can completely ignore rule three because you don't have to program not changing something. The remaining two rules can be visually demonstrated using a blinker. A blinker is any three alive cells in a straight line. If we put the blinker on the grid, we can look at all alive cells and apply rule one. If any of these cells have less than two or more than three neighbors, we'll mark it to die with an X. Now if we look at the neighbors of each alive cell and focus on only the dead cells, we can apply rule 2. If these dead cells have exactly three alive neighbors, I'll mark these to become alive with a circle. Now with the changes marked, we can move on to the next generation. Now looking at this new generation, you can imagine what the next generation is going to look like, and the next after that, and the next after that, and the next after that, and the next after that. So, before we begin, the reason that this can be either easy or difficult is because of one idea that the Game of Life suggests. The Infinite Grid. Which may not seem like a huge deal if all you have to go by is what I've said so far, but this is a glider. The glider got its unique name because it glides forever unless obstructed. Which, again, may not seem like a problem, but this shape is called an acorn. An acorn not only lasts for roughly 5,300 generations before stabilizing, but also produces 12 gliders that glide off into multiple directions. 
As you can imagine, this is a computational nightmare. This becomes more evident when we start talking about the most common way programmers create the game of life. The quote, easy way is just like your mother in college, dirty, quick, and you guessed it, easy. And it can be accomplished in as little as 80 or so lines of code, or maybe less if you optimized. I called this the limited grid game of life. The idea is simple. Considering the rules of the game are strictly dependent on live neighbors, we can use a couple multidimensional arrays and iterate over each defined cell and get the state of its eight neighbors. And I say a couple multidimensional arrays for a few reasons. Mainly, it's because each generation of the game of life has two stages, examination and then evolution. Meaning, you would need to look through the entire grid area first, discover which changes need to be made, and then go through the grid again and make those changes. This means that we need to save information, and by process of elimination, if we have one multidimensional array that stores the state of each grid cell, the only other important information left is how many alive neighbors each cell has. Also, I needed a third array, which might be unique to me because I'm using Unity. Maybe there was a different way to do this, but I used square sprites as my alive cells and instantiated them on a grid to make up the visual aspect. The third array was used to store the game objects so I could remove them when they die. Three large arrays may seem like a terrible way to go about things, but memory was the least of my worries at this point, as processing speed was far more important. This is also why I call this dirty. As you can imagine, iterating over each cell when there isn't a neighbor in sight isn't exactly the cheapest option when it comes to processing power. In my script, I limited the grid to 400 cells in both directions, which is far from infinite, but just with the 400 by 400 grid means you have 160,000 cells. And you have to check all eight neighbors for each cell, meaning for one half of one generation, you need to do a minimum of 1.28 million calculations using this method. On top of that, add another 160,000 because we have to go back and set the state of each cell means that you have a buttload of calculations that need to be done per frame which 1.5 million calculations or so, and my computer was still able to maintain 60 frames a second, but by increasing the grid size to 1,000 by 1,000, I could barely muster 15 frames a second. Instead of limiting our grid size and calculating millions of times per frame, what if we save the alive cells to a list and iterate it over those? Really good idea, I thought. This was actually the first method I thought of, but I created the other two scripts because of the problem you will see here in a minute. I called this the infinite grid game of life. The idea was that the alive and dead cells are all dependent on live neighbors in order for any change to happen. Meaning I could save all the alive cells to a list and iterate over each one and check if its state should change. I could then grab each dead cell around each alive cell and iterate over those and see if they have enough neighbors to become alive. Which is a completely logical solution, but the problem with this method is that you can't use indexers or arrays. We can't use arrays because arrays have a defined size, which newsflash is not infinite. And we've already established that calculating each cell on an infinite grid is impossible, meaning we give up the ability to use indexers as there's no correlation between our alive cell list and its location in the world anymore. This means we completely give up the ability to point directly at what we need to point at. Instead, we have to search for it. Which kind of causes an ironic exponential growth problem. For a single glider, I can manage close to 500 frames a second, but about 500 generations into an acorn, I can only squeeze out a piddly 3 frames a second. There are a bunch of different ways this could have been done, and there are tons of optimization things that could have been done as well, but I felt as though at this stage, searching through lists will always be slower than using indexers and arrays. So consider this script kind of like a rough draft. If you found a way to make this script better, let me know in the comments below. So after a few days of thinking and refreshing the mind, I had a thought. The limited grid is a computational nightmare because of how many calculations you need to make, but the upside is that you can use indexers. The infinite grid solves the computational problem by only calculating based on the alive cells, but sacrifices the ability to use indexers. So what if I combine the two? I called this the combined grid game of life. I could save the alive cells to a list, get the neighbor count, and do the calculations like I did with the infinite grid, but save the information in a multidimensional array like I did with the limited grid. 
Using this method, I would get the benefit of limiting the number of calculations per frame, but also speeding up the process by being able to point at exactly what I need to point at using indexers. The drawback? Well, like I said before, it's impossible to have an infinite grid using arrays, but also, we push most of the work onto the RAM. But I think most people won't care because I was able to maintain 100 frames a second running an acorn until I hit an out of memory exception around a grid size of about 50,000 by 50,000. The sweet spot I found to be a size of about 10,000. It maintained anywhere from 170 frames a second to about 60 depending on what's going on and a grid of 100 million cells is absolutely massive. Also, if you zoom out and try to fit the entire grid in frame, you can't even tell what's going on anymore. So you could say that even though the infinite grid would be an incredibly fun challenge, it's also mostly pointless for most people. Either way, there's three methods for creating the game of life, not saying that they are perfect, but it's a beginner project after all. Do your own research, download my code, iterate on it, and let me know how it goes. After all, I'm just someone who programs for fun and I'm sure you could do much better. Anyways, thanks for watching. Like, comment, and subscribe down below, and I promise I'll open the pod bay doors. And that's... that's a deep cut. Okay, bye.